A pro-Trump election denier, Representative Mike Johnson of Louisiana, wins the speaker's race. A week ago, barely anyone in Washington knew his name. People are curious, what does Mike Johnson think about any issue under the sun? I said, well, go pick up a Bible off your shelf and read it. That's, that's my worldview. If you don't think that moving from Kevin McCarthy to MAGA Mike Johnson shows the ascendance of this movement and where the power in the Republican Party truly lies, uh, then, then you're not paying attention. What does MAGA Mike mean for the country, for Congress, for Ukraine and Israel? And what does his win say about the GOP? Next. This is Washington Week with the Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular... You get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Koo and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. There are so many questions about the speaker's race, which came at a tumultuous moment in the world. I'm going to discuss all of this with McKay Coppins, a staff writer and my colleague at The Atlantic. He's also the author of the new book, Romney, A Reckoning. John Dickerson is the anchor of CBS News Primetime with John Dickerson. It's a good name for a show. <laughs> Nia Malika Henderson is CNN's senior political analyst. Thank you all for being here. John Dickerson, yeah. <laughs> welcome back to the show. Welcome back to the, this is your one millionth appearance. Yeah, it's good to be back. And yeah. we, I, you spent a lot of time around this table and I'm lucky to be back. So. I, that's a very lovely the way you said that. I appreciate it. McKay, welcome to the show. Nia, welcome back. Uh, let's just talk about I'll, I'll, let me Nia, let me just start with you this this speaker's race yeah. um one of the stranger events in a pretty strange period in a strange city obviously but what does it mean that the house just picked one of its more obscure and most right-wing members to serve as speaker well listen if there was ever any doubt that the republican party was the party of donald trump this should end that doubt this is a congressperson who came to power in 2016 the same uh, year obviously that donald trump was elected he has garnered the nickname maga mike primarily because he has been a trump loyalist right if you think about his role uh, in denying the election it was a pivotal role he was sort of the whip right in gathering support to try to overturn uh, the election, particularly in, in these swing states, joined uh, with Texas in, in filing this uh, lawsuit. And this is how he sort of comes to power. Uh, in part, I think the fact that he is little known was uh, more like a feature rather than a bug to a lot of the Republicans who joined hands unanimously in supporting him. Uh, Donald Trump will be pleased with this. I think also in many ways... I mean, Donald Trump actually kind of uh, took out the yes, previous... Yes, the previous guy. <laughs> My, my the guy, the guy but, was speaker for four hours. Exactly, because he yeah. wasn't MAGA. No, Republicans will be pleased, but uh, Democrats will be pleased as well, right? I mean, they are also calling him MAGA Mike. They think mm. that it's a good thing that he uh, is an election denier, that uh, he is very much a sort of social conservative, a culture warrior. Uh, they think in terms of branding the Republican Party as an extremist party, uh, that his being in this role will help them do that. John, um, two things. One, one is, have you noticed that MAGA Mike sounds suspiciously like Magic Mike? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, we don't have to. We can do that in the web. Right, exactly. We'll do that on Twitter. But I just, I just, it just keeps, uh, oh, it keeps an earworm, you know. Yeah, uh, exactly. I used to trade baseball cards with MAGA Mike. It's a, it's a, it's a problematic earworm. Let's yeah. just say that. But the, 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 the serious question is, is you know, uh, so a couple of years ago, or a little bit more than a couple of years ago, right after January sixth, it was obviously considered. Uh, you were in bad odor if you were uh, supported the insurrection or you were an election denier. Now we have this election denier. 
uh, in the speakership, it seems like it's a prerequisite mm -hmm. for Republican success. To well, go to to go to your point, no, this is Trump's party. But 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 how did we get from here there to well, here? Well, as Neat mentioned, Tom Emmer, uh, who was briefly the speaker-elect for four hours or so, the congressman from uh, Minnesota, Donald Trump had a heckler's veto over him, basically because Tom Emmer had voted to certify the 2020 election. Mike Johnson spearheaded the effort to block that. And when he was asked... And wait, just go into that a little bit, because mm -hmm. this is important. He wasn't a follower. He no, was he was the... a leader, so people were Googling his name to figure out who he was, but those who did know about, know about him knew one thing, which is that he had spearheaded this effort to try to declare the votes in various states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, unconstitutional, to block uh, the certification of Joe Biden's uh, election. And then later he went on the radio, he talked about how Hugo Chavez mm -hmm. had been a, a part of the election, which is thoroughly debunked. He just did. Because, right? Right? Well, yes. And, well, that's a technical is, issue. Yeah. Yeah. But in other words, he wasn't making just constitutional critiques. He was also engaging in, in some of the most bananas, um, which is, I think, a legal term, yeah. um, <laughs> claims about the last election. Okay, so he was asked about this after he'd been voted by his Republican colleagues to be the speaker, but before the official vote. And there were a number of his colleagues around him, and they booed down the questioner from the press who had asked about it as if it were rude to bring this up, or it was something in the distance. One, one of the congresswomen told Virginia the reporter, yeah, yeah, told told Rachel Scott to, to shut up, I think. Right. Yeah, actually said the word shut up. As if it were rude or something in the distant past. This is in the absolute m present, and it should be at the heart of what might Mike Johnson thinks of in terms of his job, because what do we have legislatures for? To peacefully adjudicate disputes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what happened on January 6th. The system for peacefully adjudicating a dispute, which is what an election in a way is, was overthrown or attempted to overthrown, I should say, by violence by people who thought, I don't like the outcome, so I'm going to engage in violence to get a better outcome. Some lawmakers, spearheaded by Donald Trump, tried to overturn that outcome through a number of other methods. Johnson was a part of that team. Well, now he leads an institution that is supposed to take disputes and work them out and come up with an answer. And the losers in those, those legislative fights can't go around and engage in violence, can't go around and try some other way. He is now the head of an institution. And so as the head of that institution, when people bring up 2020, he should say, we believe in a system where you abide by the rules and you abide by the outcome. But he didn't, he didn't say any of that. And you would think as the head of an institution that exists for that purpose, you would at least want to be saying, you know, I am now the fire chief and I'm not a party that believes in arson. Well, you know, it's interesting because we've been through this drama before. There was hope, misplaced hope, that Donald Trump would grow in office. But McKay, what are, what are the chances that Mike Johnson, who really we haven't heard very much about at all, what are the chances that he understands this role or are the or all the incentives not to understand. Well, so that's that's what I was going to say. I think the problem is that there's really no incentive for somebody in his position at this moment in his party to grow in any way, right? He, I think he could very easily. He seems like a smart enough guy. Understand that he has a certain job to do and that he needs to set aside, uh, or at least try to move on past, uh, you know, his election denialism or whatever. But. You, the way he got here was by towing the Trump line, right? By doing the things Donald Trump wants. And Donald Trump is still the boss. He's the party boss. He's the leader of the party. He's going to have to, in order to hold on to his job, he's going to have to continue to do what Donald Trump and the MAGA wing of the party wants. Is this, one more question on this about Trump, because you've been following Trump since before the beginning, actually. Is this further proof that Trump has the nomination locked up? I mean, I haven't seen any any evidence to the contrary. The, the fact that he has this much control over the House of Representatives, for a guy who really doesn't wade into congressional affairs at all, doesn't seem to care that much about legislation, the fact that he can make a few calls and, and put out a few posts on Truth Social and basically swing the speaker election, I think shows that there, there really is no serious challenge to his status. As it's actually party. extraordinary, yeah. yes. Jeff. And his attempt to overthrow the last election, as we've already said, is not a liability. It's the centerpiece of his campaign. Yes. So, in other words, the thing that should make him uh, an objectionable choice to the, for the office, which is to say you can't be a protector of the Constitution if you've tried to thwart the Constitution by reversing a free and fair election, that should be the number one thing that should hurt him. And, in fact, it's helped him in his party. Yeah, so, it, gravity it, is upside down. No, I think that's right. <clears throat> Joe Biden was asked about this at, yeah. at, the, at the press conference when, uh, when 
Johnson ascended to power, was he worried about what will happen in 2024 if Joe Biden uh, is reelected and Donald Trump loses? He sort of had, I think, a gracious answer and essentially said he's not really worried about it. Uh, he believes in the Constitution. But it will certainly, uh, all eyes will be on what is the House going to do uh, well, in 2024. Well, let me ask you this. Let's go, let's go deep on Mike Johnson. Yeah. Uh, tell us a Tell us about him, where he where he falls within the Republican conference, within the Republican caucus. Yeah. Uh, no, listen, he, I think he is on the far right of the Republican uh, caucus. You, you heard him there uh, talk about uh, what do you want to know about him? How can you learn about him? He says, uh, read the Bible. He is a true Christian uh, evangelical. He's a Southerner from Louisiana. We haven't had a Southerner in that position since Newt Gingrich uh, in the mid-'90s. And he's sort of a... a in the way that Newt Gingrich was very much a culture warrior, very much partisan, uh, he is that uh, as as well. Very much uh, a part of wedding conservatism to Christianity, right? Uh, do, and, uh, he uses his background, I think, as a, as a constitutional lawyer uh, to push for some of these causes and to sort of uh, push for the sort of the collapse of the separation of, of church and state. So I think in this position, he's going to be very vocal. He's not going to be m maybe be as sort of combative. He kind of has a, a warm and conversational demeanor, but his ideology is very much, I think, in keeping with the far right of the party. You know, something you just mentioned, I want to mention this to John, because we're older than you, too. <laughs> no offense, John. But no, I mean, you mentioned Newt Gingrich, yeah. and I hadn't really thought, I, I, I've thought about this victory as a victory for Trump, but we covered Newt okay. Gingrich. This seems like a victory for Gingrichism in a kind of way, like to turn a hyper-partisan house. In other words, as without even the the make believe of comedy. Tell me yeah, I'm wrong. Yes, um, um, yes and no. When Newt Gingrich was bounced from the House, he uh, railed against the cannibals in his own conference, own Republican conference, who didn't find Gingrich sufficiently pure. That's also what John Boehner essentially said when he right. was bounced. It's also what happened to Kevin McCarthy. So. It is, a, it is a different form of what Newt Gingrich may have been the initiator of in terms of being more partisan, in terms of treating the opposition as the enemy. Yeah. But also remember, before impeachment during the Clinton and, and Gingrich years, Clinton and Gingrich were meeting privately to try to find a way to come up with a budget deal and actually get some work done. What's interesting about the moment we're in now and the big challenge for Mike Johnson is, as I was mentioning earlier, does he feel an obligation to the stewardship obligations of being a speaker? And that includes making deals with the other side when you don't own but, every part of the uh, legislature. But McKay, add on to that. <clears throat> if he turns out to be a statesman, What's the over-under on when he gets overthrown? Well, this <laughs> right. is the problem, yeah. right? The, the current rules that have been put in place by the, the House Republican Conference are such that it, it, very quickly any small number of Republicans can es essentially band together and bounce the speaker, right? And so, uh, you know, I think if, if, if this new speaker does veer from kind of towing the MAGA line, I would not, I would not expect him to last very long. Right, right. And, and the test will come up very quickly, right? When you think about uh, the deadlines that are coming up for funding the government, uh, Ukraine aid, for instance, uh, Israel aid uh, as well. So we're going to see very quickly if, in fact, they're going to give him a bit of a leash. Right. There's one other trend that his election suggests, which is the idea that basically a novice can come into these very complicated this, yes. political jobs and just bing, bang, bing, <laughs> that everybody else has failed only because of a lack of will, mm -hmm. that the jobs are not in inherently complicated. And he doesn't come with any of the skills that are a part of what you have to do in the job, which is massage your members. You have to build coalitions. You have to sometimes um, massage the truth in order to get a, a coalition together. He was elected where all of those are signs of selling out. There's and no incentives here for governance in the traditional model. Right. And if you perform governance in the tr traditional model, you're seen as a sellout. So right. it's, it works, yes. So like Eight to ten days. We have a new, <laughs> right. we have a new speaker's race. I think yeah, that's, what, what, the... that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Uh, let, let me go to uh, McKay and, and 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 to frame this out. So you've written this uh, wonderful book uh, about Mitt Romney. I wouldn't. I, I I would say that even if I didn't like you, <laughs> it's a really one of the one of the most important books of the whole Trump era. I really do believe. Um, and and you know you are you know you're the Boswell to Romney's Johnson. You know the. The sunny to his share. You're you're everything. I'll take the first comparison. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little more uncomfortable with the second, but go on, go on. I, I kind of like the second one. <laughs> um, you you're, 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 you 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 have a, almost a mind meld with um, with with Mitt Romney. Um, it's an interesting moment 
-hmm. to, for, for Romney, I think, to, to watch the party completely drift yeah. away from where he is. I, I'm sure you've talked to him recently about what's been going on in the House. How does he understand this? And how do, how do that, that remnant faction understand what's going on? Well, so for him, I mean, just on the question of Mike Johnson, the, there's, there's kind of two problems for him. The first is just, uh, for Mitt Romney, election denialism is the litmus test that if you don't pass, you, if to him, you're not a serious political figure. I mean, for, for Mitt Romney, he is very, he's been alarmed ever since January 6th by this kind of what he considers creeping authoritarianism within the party. Would you do one favor for our audience and just give, give us one example of how Romney feels about a, a, anybody in the anybody in his own car? Because there's some amazing there's some amazing stuff in this in this book. Well, uh, you know, he I, okay. So he talked about Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley, uh, and he told me that. The, he considers those two guys some of the smartest people in the Senate, and that's why he he's kind of so repelled by them because he he knows that they're too smart to believe the things they say. And what what drives him crazy is hearing them kind of tout these election conspiracy theories because he he basically told me that, that it's so disingenuous. Like they know better, but they pretend like they believe this stuff because they think so little of the Republican base. Romney actually has more sympathy for the true believers. Yeah, he told the, me. The, right. The Ron, daft one. So Ron yeah. Johnson, he said, uh, you know, he's hacked. Wisconsin senator. Yeah, Wisconsin senator who, who's a known kind of conspiracy theory fan. He, he's, he often gets into fights with him and says, uh, you know, Ron, are there any conspiracies you don't believe in? But at the same time says, I actually respect him because I think he actually believes all these crazy things. And that's not true of these other senators. Right. Mike Johnson, the other problem, though, with that Mitt Romney has with him is the point that John just made. He, he doesn't have any leadership experience. And for Mitt Romney, that's just a non-starter. You need, these are complicated jobs. Being Speaker of the House is an actual job. And you, knew, you, you know, traditionally, ask Nancy Pelosi, ask John Boehner, you would have to have some knowledge of the inner workings of Congress, how to, you know, you manage all the egos, how to, you know, form coalitions. And Mike Johnson has shown no ability to do that. And you have to do all of those things to do the people's business, addressing the problems of the day through this system that was set up to do so. I mean, it's not just like, you don't know how to slap backs. If you don't know how to do it, you don't get results for the people who are out there voting for you. And that's the real challenge here. It's, it's that the standard is now just barely keeping the government open. The country faces severe and significant problems, not the least of which are these corrosive forces we've been talking about, which make it impossible to answer the problems that the country faces. Right. Yeah. But, but that's at the heart of, of this. But right. it's also true that Mitt Romney, I think, recognized the power of Donald Trump in, in 2012 when he wanted to get the endorsement of, of Donald Trump, got the endorsement of Donald Trump, even though at that point Donald Trump was still sort of Donald Trump and running around uh, with the sort of birther conspiracy theory. So he recognizes the power and in some ways, I mean, helped to elevate Trump in, in 2012 and well, kind of put the veneer agree or of... Disagree. Yeah. So we talk about this yeah. a lot, and, and he, he reckons with this a lot in the book. His, his argument is that at, in 2012, Donald Trump, he still considered kind of a buffoonish celebrity with crazy ideas, yes, but like his argument was if Barack Obama can take, you know, endorsements from Kanye West, why can't I stand on a stage with the Celebrity Apprentice host? You know, I think that he and I disagree a little about, about that, but like, it, you know, his argument is that ever since Donald Trump has actually become a major political force, he has been an outspoken opponent of him, and, and that 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 that, right. that outweighs whatever he did to to help him. One more question on Rom: Is there anything that Mitt Romney sees, any trend in his party that he thinks is that runs opposite to to to, to Trumpism, you know, election denialism, the elevation of Mike Johnson? Is there anything I, at all? I have not heard in my two years of conversations with him a lot of hope about the future of the Republican Party. Right. If anything, from the time I started talking to him in, in early two, 2021 to, you know, when I finished the interviews for the book earlier this year, he was more alienated than ever and, and feels like he has no home in the GOP anymore. Right. So the, his only hope is that some future generation of Republicans will come in and kind of wash out the... The older, the older set, but the problem is a lot of the younger Republicans. Matt Gates is one of these like younger members of Congress, and he's one of the most radical. You know, and Matt Gates has a lot more power in the Republican Party than Mitt Romney. Yeah. Obviously. Oh, no question. Because it, it, 
Look, go I, ahead. No, go ahead. It depends whether if you're coming up in the next generation, you've been taught by the previous generation to use your skills as a lawmaker. And I think this is what irritates Romney about uh, Cruz and Hawley, is to use your considerable skills to shine up the objectionable for public consumption. Yep. That you are not trying to strive to match your values with your actions, but you're really just in an elaborate game of, of making things look good to retain power, to right. gain influence, or do whatever. Right. Nia, I gotta ask this question, because I, I, I just don't understand this. I, I, uh, Donald Trump, Mike Johnson, we understand 91 felony counts on the, on the Trump side, election denialism, all of the craziness. Um, Johnson, the rightmost edge of the Republican Party. I understand how they've taken control of the House and I understand how they've taken control of the party. How do they possibly win a general election? Do they have a plan to win a general? Well, listen, I think if you look at where the polling stands now, uh, it's a neck and neck race. Is it early? Absolutely. It's quite early. You have a challenger now to, to Joe Biden in, in, in Dean Phillips, who filed, I think, in, in New Hampshire yeah. uh, to, to, to compete with uh, Joe Biden. Joe Biden's problem now is that Democrats are sort of souring on him. If you look at, you know, sort of the internals, only about 75 percent of Democrats approve of Joe Biden. They would need that to be 90 percent or so. Is that to be age doing... primarily? It, it, I think it's primarily age. Yes, it's primarily age. And, you know, if you think about what the Biden coalition is, it's obviously part of the Obama coalition. Young folks, people of color, uh, progressives, there are some souring on Biden with, with those groups. And so that's why you see this neck and neck race. Is that souring partially happening over Biden's support for Israel right now? That's, a, that's, that's in this moment. Yeah. But is that, um, if they're faced with Trump v. Biden, where do those progressives go? No, I think year? this is a, a really good question. Uh, Joe Biden uh, recently met with some Muslim American leaders because they have a problem uh, right. with his rhetoric around uh, this war, his rhetoric around Palestinians right. uh, who are in Gaza. So, yes, there is worry right now about the fraying of this coalition and the ways in which uh, they don't really approve of right. Joe Biden's uh, handling of the, the conflict in Israel. But again, it's early. Right. One of Let's the, just, yeah, stay, yeah. stay on this question that the Republicans, how do they grow from what they are right now? Or are they just banking on Biden's unpopularity and certain structural advantages to get them through? Yeah, I think that's all true and good. And I think also that chaos helps the out team. So in other words, all the chaos that happened in the House um, fits into Donald Trump's view, which is basically like, it's all chaotic in Washington. You know, he's selling chaos and offering uh, offering order. In other words, I can fix it. Remember, he said, I alone can, I alone fix, it. can fix it. And you'd yeah. think, well, his presidency in which there were considerable failures because he didn't recognize or build a team to manage the complexities of the job. Nevertheless, we've been talking about this idea that you can have a speaker rise with none of the skills for a speakership. And nevertheless, now he is the second well, now he's the most powerful Republican, or at least right. has the most powerful right. post. Second in line for the presidency mm -hmm. as well. So if, if all of you, if there, there are a lot of people in the country who think all this stuff in Washington is foolishness. And so why not send somebody in there who uh, is promising order and who also upsets the ruling class but, in Washington. But isn't the problem with that argument that we all lived through the Trump presidency, right? Like, the, 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 he sold order in 2016, yeah. and I think it worked to a certain extent. Remember his convention speech at the Republican convention was all about, you know, the, the chaos and lawlessness in the streets. Yeah. I'm not sure that, that that message works the same way this time. I, I think you're absolutely right. That is totally possible, but... People also said after January 6th, well, the Republican Party has touched the hot stove and they it's won't no, do that again. That's right. That's the right. party is sitting on top of the stove right now. The leading person... The They're having big meetings on top of a hot yeah. stove. The speaker <laughs> is a part of that crew and the nominee, the likely yeah. nominee of the party, maintains the delusion that the election was stolen from yeah. him. Yeah, let, and, let, there, yeah, and there's the thought, I think, among many Americans that the economy was better under Donald Trump. You right. add yeah. that to perhaps there are going to be at least maybe two third-party candidates uh, in, in the ballot. In right. these very I mean, this states. is why the election is going to be close, because yeah. the, it just the, 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 the way that our country is structured right now, no matter who the nominee almost is, there's going to be 48 percent on each side. Okay, let me, last question to you. Does, does this new speaker help the Trump cause? Does it solidify him further? Does it do anything to expand 
Trump's reach? I think that Trump is going to have somebody in his pocket, right, who can do what he wants. I think the question is just whether he'll know how to use that power. And, and you know, I, I think it's a, it, it is an open question how Johnson will govern. Maybe he'll right. surprise us. Right. And I just want to ask one final, final question <laughs> related to that. Final, final, final question, <laughs> uh, which is, are we all sure that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee? Quick answers. It seems likely. Good answer. It seems hard to conjure a way in which he doesn't win within the normal structures of politics. Okay. Um, I'm even more sure than them, I would say. I, I think it's very, very likely. <laughs> well, thank you uh, all for, for, for joining me tonight. This is great. Unfortunately, we need to leave it there for now, but I want to thank our wonderful panelists for joining us and, and sharing your reporting. Uh, McKay's book is excellent, as I mentioned. Um, for the latest on the Middle East, visit theatlantic.com, and be sure to tune into PBS News Weekend Saturday for a conversation with an American family desperate to escape Gaza. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular... You get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.